Alright, finishing up this last part to this chapter 7. Demand for unconditional surrender. So this is um, another one of the factors that uh, contributed to Japan's defeats. Um, actually, if I could change the title a little bit to make it more relevant to the issue, it would be Japan's, Japan's refusal to give in to the demand for unconditional surrender. And that contributed to their, hmm, they will contribute to the dropping of the atomic bombs, not to Japan's defeats. Right, so, um, oh, I'm sorry, actually, under under the, oh, I just realized that I made a hoo-ha here. I wanted to make it, break it more cleanly. So this demand for unconditional surrender is actually part of the Allied victory in Europe. So after they defeated Germany, so um, they... Uh, they focused on Japan and they actually demanded for unconditional surrender from Japan. Uh, they wanted a complete victory. They wanted to avoid a repeat of the situation in World War I in Europe. And since they were very outraged at all the Japanese atrocities, which I will not go into, but if you just Google about Japanese atrocities in World War II, you can find out more about that. Like I think for Singapore, one of the... No, sorry, not for Singapore. One uh, for Nanjing. Uh, Nanking in China one of the main things main atrocities that the Japanese committed was the um, these two officers had this head cutting competition to see who can cut off most heads in I think a given amount of time and it was published in the Japanese newspapers like it was a very good spot yeah these are some of the examples of the atrocities they committed now so these atrocities given that they are such so serious in nature um, the, the the allied powers were very unhappy and they wanted to see them totally defeated now when they say they want to avoid this repeat of situation in World War One, it's a bit like in Germany you know when they <sighs> To be honest, actually, I'm not quite sure what they were talking about because Germany was, according to my knowledge, they were rather defeated completely, I think. Right, never mind. Let's move on. Okay, so um, the Japanese were, not, were determined not to surrender completely. So they wanted to actually... Um, they actually wanted to have uh, some sort of uh, conditional surrender. So unconditional surrender means to say that when you surrender, right, you cannot have any say. You cannot say that, okay, I surrender to you, but uh, can you actually let the emperor go and let him have a good life somewhere in, I don't know, Switzerland? Um, no, that's not going to happen. So once you surrender, right, it means to say that the victors, okay, the winners will actually get to decide what to do to you completely. So the Japanese leaders could not bring themselves to review uh, their weakness to the allies let alone surrender so this is something that would tarnish their honor right so the japanese uh, leaders they would never ever actually give in to that okay um so their refusal to give in to that meant to say that they had to continue fighting and continue stretching the war and uh, if i'm not wrong the japanese actually they were they were actually preparing the citizens for like one last bit of fighting and even preparing the women and children to fight till the end, you know, if there was an invasion of the Japanese homeland, which up to that point, there wasn't any yet. Lah. Okay, so the final factor that led to their defeat was the dropping of the atomic bomb. Um, so this one, this one is something that's of great interest, which I really spent like five minutes talking about it at the beginning of the lecture. But uh, let me caution you first. I think this is interesting. I'm happy that most students express their interest in understanding a lot more about this. So they read up a lot about this and uh, they, re they remember quite a bit of information about this, the details of which. But the details of this are not exactly actually important. Like you don't have to tell me on um, how many people actually died and, uh, and on which particular day and then how much destruction it brings because uh, okay, of course it depends on the question, uh, but so far I have not come across a question in which requires you to furnish this kind of specific details about the dropping of the atomic bomb. But still, go and read it. It's interesting. I think you will uh, read about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Now, uh, this caught the... Now, a little bit of background of the atomic bomb. Albert Einstein actually worked on the atomic bomb as well. He's always part of one of the scientists that actually contributed to producing the atomic bomb. 
under this thing called the Manhattan Project. So there's also this particular, uh, I think it's a comic book character called uh, Dr. Manhattan under this series called The Watchmen. There's a movie about it. It's fantastic. I loved it. And um, yeah, so this Manhattan Project eventually produced the atomic bomb. And they were considering using the atomic bomb when it was becoming increasingly violent and when Japan actually said that they would not surrender unconditionally. So it's like, oh no, okay, I have to use the bomb now. At the same time, other reasons for using the bomb impressed the Soviet Union. Now this particular first point, the Allies wanted to impress the Soviet Union. This will be important to us when we're studying about the next chapter, which is the Cold War. Okay, and uh, why did the U.S. want to impress the, impress the Soviet Union? Why did they have to impress the Soviet Union? And when they do this, they would actually defeat Japan without Soviet Union's help. And again, all these small little details are that one point alone about defeating Japan without Soviet Union's help and impressing the Soviet Union, all this will be covered under the Cold War. And when you come back to this during a revision for O-Levels, you will definitely find that this is, you are able to make the, the links, okay, and understand this point much better. Now, although the Soviet Union had worked with Britain to defeat Germany, they were divided by ideology. This is a little bit about um, the Cold War itself already, okay? And so the details of which are in that table. So basically, Soviet Union wanted communist world order. Britain and USA wanted democratic world order. And because of this, they started clashing against each other. We'll go into details of what exactly is a Cold War, but um, it's the opposite of a hot war, basically, which I'm not joking here, okay? Now, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, so the first bomb was dropped. Uh, little boy, that's the name of the bomb, it was dropped over Hiroshima. And a third of the city's population were killed instantly. And um, also destroyed many things. And, um, and um, shortly after they dropped the first bomb, Japan did not surrender unconditionally. And so they decided to drop the second bomb on 9th of August 1945 and with that again a lot more people were killed and they decided eventually to surrender unconditionally now the bomb itself right it's not just about killing people but uh, about the long-term effects of the bomb so nuclear radiation they have long-lasting effects on human body so it's not just about the people who are getting killed but people who are affected who, who, who survived but had to suffer from the nuclear radiation and uh, eventually had some very unpleasant things happening to themselves. You can go Google about what happens about it and the effects of nuclear radiation on people. The pictures might not be pretty, so I'll just warn you before you do that Googling. All right, and so finally on 15th of August, uh, Hirohito, the emperor, decided to announce Japan's unconditional surrender to the Allies. Now, with the dropping of the bombs, it, it forced them to actually end the war. And a very interesting thing about the emperor announcing the unconditional surrender, one of the significant things that in history was that the Japanese people, they've never actually really heard the emperor speak before. You know, this is not like today where media, TV, radio... I mean, they had radio last time, but it's not as prevalent as it is today for us to watch a video, watch anything at all so conveniently and hear another person's voice. But um, so when they, when the emperor actually went on the, I think it's a radio, to announce Japan's defeat, uh, the people were also severely affected because of his voice. It was very high and squeaky and not... You know, basically it doesn't sound like me at all. Um, yeah, and uh, it was it it made them think like, oh goodness, this is our emperor, and oh that's so disappointing. And it, it sort of and they already know that they lost, and then they hear the emperor like this is like one more nail into the coffin, you know. And when they actually heard that they have to uh, surrender, and they had to hear it from a squeaky little old man, yeah. So that wasn't exactly pleasant for them. Uh. Now, um, so on 22nd, uh, sorry, 2nd of September 1945, formal instrument of surrender was signed on board the American battleship USS Missouri, and so that brings an end to the war. So, now, uh, I hope you're not hearing, I hope the recording's not sensitive enough to pick up my neighbor's baby crying. But um, now, uh, so this brings an end to the chapter. So there are many different factors leading up to the end of the 
war in Asia Pacific, you need to make the links very clearly. Okay, you need to make the links very clearly to how did Japan eventually lose the war. One of the very easy draft mark SEQ questions that I can potentially ask you is the main reason that Japan lost the war was because of let's see, because of the overextension of the Japanese Empire. Then you got to explain the factor, give the other factors. That is a very easy question to do, and by the way, okay, and um, that will be an easy twelve mark question to do. Uh, what can be challenging here is that they ask you eight mark questions on spe small specific parts of the chapter. So they can actually cross this chapter with chapter six. They make this particular chapter seven um, an eight mark question SEQ, and chapter six and twelve mark question SEQ. That's what they can do. And then after that, then you would have to deal with the fine details of this chapter. La. Okay, so it's not just about the broad overarching main question of what is the main reason for Japan's defeat, but you need to look at the specific details to prepare yourself for any potential difficult eight mark question. This question, as of the time of recording, 2016 December, after the 2016 O-Levels uh, for core history, it has still not been tested. And for elective history, I think this chapter has been tested before. I cannot remember, but yeah, nevertheless, you know, still prepare yourself for whatever that's possible. Okay, don't, don't spot chapters. Right, that brings an end to this particular chapter 7 for reasons for Japan's defeat in World War II.